Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here, you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. While you're listening, you might want to check out the Weird Darkness website. At WeirdDarkness.com, you can find paranormal and horror audiobooks I've narrated, streaming video of horror hosts and old horror movies. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, anxiety, or thoughts of suicide. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Coming up in this episode of Weird Darkness… Charles died in a horrible train accident, but before anyone knew he was dead, his family received 35 calls from his phone after the tragedy. Weirdo family member Krista Arendt describes something about herself that is somewhat unusual. Unusual to her and kind of creepy to those around her. You see, sometimes people think she's dead. Army First Lieutenant Paul Byron Whipke was as brave as he was handsome. After telling his fellow troops that he was going out for a drink, he never came back and was never heard from again by anyone. And Final Destination is a massive franchise with numerous films, novels, and comic books in the universe it's created. Fortunately, it's all from the minds of horror fiction authors. Or is it? There are real cases where some narrowly escaped death, only for death to catch up to them soon thereafter. Very soon. Now bolt your doors lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Mysterious phone calls from the dead make for excellent horror movie plots, but this eerie phenomenon also happens in real life. Many stories of unexplained phone calls show that they're not just the result of grief-stricken imaginings. Although people try to explain these odd occurrences by blaming malfunctioning cell phone technology, reports of phantom phone calls go back to at least 1967. Charles E. Peck's Metrolink death is one of the most prominent and creepy stories about phone calls from dead people since author Dean Kuntz's deceased mother phoned him to give him a warning. Peck was killed instantly in a horrible 2008 Metrolink commuter train accident where a total of 25 people died and 135 were injured. But before anyone knew Peck was dead, his family members received 35 calls from his phone for several hours following the disaster. Whether it was due to phone damage or Charles reaching out from beyond, we may never know. But it's nice to believe that even those who have passed are only a phone call away. 49-year-old Charles Peck worked for Delta Airlines. He was considering leaving his job in Salt Lake City International Airport for a job at Van Nuys Airport in Los Angeles to be closer to his fiancée, Andrea Katz, and had an interview there. Although the couple was ready to get married, the fact that they didn't live in the same state was an issue. Then the disaster occurred. Katz was on her way to pick him up from the train station when she heard the news of the accident on the radio. Peck had three children from a previous marriage, one of whom was on his afterlife phone call list. 
Andrea Katz heard about the crash on the radio as she was driving to pick up Peck from the train station and was relieved when she received a call from his phone. Other friends and family members of Katz were in the same position. After the crash, Peck's phone placed calls to his son, sister, brother, and stepmother. In all, about 35 calls were made during the 11 hours that followed the accident. According to one source, the final call from Peck's phone came at 3.28 a.m., about an hour before his body was found. Charles Peck was a passenger on a Metrolink commuter train traveling through the San Fernando Valley in California on September 12, 2008. It collided headfirst with a Union Pacific freight train at 83 miles per hour when the conductor failed to stop at a red light. The impact was devastating, and of the 225 people aboard the Metrolink, at least 25 died, and more than 100 were seriously injured. The engineer sitting at the front of the train was killed instantly as well. The freight train was carrying only three crew members, but it was demolished in the accident. The disaster later became known as the Chatsworth train crash, and it's still considered the worst commuter train accident in the history of California. At first, Peck's loved ones must have been excited when they saw his name pop up on their phone screens. As the calls continued, they had hoped that he was still alive and trapped within the rubble of the crash. Unfortunately, they were unable to actually talk to him. All they heard when they answered his calls was static. However, Andrea Katz used the opportunity to communicate with their fiancé and to let him know that she was with him, shouting messages of encouragement like, hang in there, baby, we're going to get you out, you're going to be okay. Other people who claim to have received phone calls from beyond also report hearing static or a voice that seemed very faint and far away. Before rescue workers discovered Charles Peck's body in the wreckage, they had no reason not to believe the calls placed to his family meant he was still alive. As it became clear they probably weren't going to find any survivors in the crash, their rescue efforts turned into a mission to recover bodies. But when yet another call came from Peck's phone, they decided to trace it to find his location. Unfortunately, they discovered his body and knew that he died on impact. Police never revealed if Peck's phone was found. Although rescue teams were excited because the phone calls might mean Charles Peck was still alive, that wasn't the case. They discovered Peck's body an hour after the last phone call was placed. According to anecdotal sources like forums and unsolved mysteries sites, the coroner was unable to find signs that Peck had survived for any amount of time after the crash, confirming the calls were not made while he was still alive. Anyone who has ever butt-dialed a number knows it's possible to make a phone call accidentally. Perhaps an object was sitting on top of Peck's phone, causing it to make random calls. The phone was most likely severely damaged during the disaster, so it may have malfunctioned. Peck's broken phone may have called his speed dial list. When this story was posted on Reddit, several users shared their own creepy stories of malfunctioning phones and posted eerie phone activity stories from online forums. The possibility that Peck's phone suffered from technical issues shouldn't be overlooked. Although rescue workers were able to locate Charles Peck's body successfully, his phone was never discovered. It's possible that it was completely destroyed in the disaster, or damaged to the point of malfunctioning, but why it made calls to several of the people Peck was closest to, we may never know. Perhaps he was reaching out to tell his loved ones not to worry or say goodbye. Maybe he took it with him into the afterlife like ghosts who are seen in the clothes they're wearing when they passed. Since the rescue team was able to trace the calls to locate his body, maybe Peck was simply leading them to it. No one will ever know for sure, so this story may forever remain a mystery. Investigators believe the conductor of the Metrolink train was responsible for the crash after he failed to stop at a red light. The commuter train was running on the same track as the freight train and was directly in its path. 
It's likely that the conductor was distracted by his phone and was too busy texting to notice his mistake. After the disaster, a team came forward and admitted that they had received a text from the conductor immediately before the crash. The last text sent from the conductor phone happened 22 seconds before the impact. Intrigued by the many stories of people receiving phone calls from the deceased, Psy investigators D. Scott Rogo and Raymond Bayless did research and published a book about their findings in 1979. Their research has recently been continued by another paranormal researcher, Callum Cooper. While some people have reported seeing the name or number of a deceased acquaintance appear on their caller ID, others claim to have spoken to someone they later discovered passed away before the call was made. According to a list of true accounts by a paranormal researcher, someone named Crystal S. shared, I was at my mom's house, and I was calling a friend who lived nearby. She was at her cousin's house, so I looked up the number in the phone book. It was the only Owens in the phone book, so I knew it was my friend's cousin's number. I called and it didn't even ring, but an old lady answered. She said, hello. I asked, is Amelia there? Amelia is my friend Jessica's cousin. The old lady said, no, dear, Amelia isn't here. I should be expecting her any minute now. So I thought nothing of it and hung up. I told Jessica about it and she said, Amelia's grandma's dead. And we were there all day long. We were sitting right by the phone. It never rang all day. In another anecdote from the same list, a salesperson named Mary B. remembers, I made a sales call to Pennsylvania. It started just like any other call. Yes, I need to speak to Mr. or Mrs. B. The woman identified herself as Mrs. B, and I continued on with the normal sales call. She seemed very interested and asked a lot of questions, but when I came to the decision-making, she quickly stopped me, insisting that I had to talk to her husband. Her objections were the same every time I attempted to close. She also quickly pointed out that since his retirement, he spent a great deal of time fishing and was not easy to get in touch with, and it'd be best to try early in the morning, before he left for his favorite hobby. On the callback, the husband did answer the phone. I introduced myself in the normal fashion and explained that I'd been talking to his wife the previous day and she'd suggested that I speak to him. You can imagine the shock and horror when he stated to me, distraught, "'Lady, I don't know who you were talking to, but my wife died and I'm not in the mood to speak to anyone.' With that, he quickly hung up the phone. People who've passed on aren't limited to phone calls or hauntings in the modern age. They often use email and social media sites such as Facebook to contact their loved ones. For instance, Jack Fries passed unexpectedly in 2011 from a heart arrhythmia only to contact his friends through email approximately six months later. Fries's friends reported emails sent from his account that included details from some of their last conversations. One friend tried replying but never received a response. People sometimes claim their deceased friends have liked their posts on Facebook or sent them messages like the viral Reddit thread about messages a deceased Emily allegedly sent to her boyfriend. But I'll let you read those for yourself. I'll place a link in the show notes. Charles was already dead, but one of our weirdo family members who is still very much alive has the problem of people mistaking her for being dead. More than once. Her story is coming up. And speaking of living and dying, it appears the premise of the Final Destination movie franchise might not be all that far-fetched, as there are numerous stories of people barely scraping past a fatal incident only to meet their demise shortly thereafter. These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. Hey Weirdos! Well, we're celebrating the anniversary of Weird Darkness, which began in October 2015, and as you know, every October we use this opportunity to raise funds to help people who suffer with depression. It's our Overcoming the Darkness campaign, 
And right now, our current tally is $1,675, working towards our $5,000 goal. And I do have a few people to thank. Deborah came in with $50. We also had an anonymous donation of $50, so thank you to whoever you are. Karen sent in $30, and get this, Dave sent in $500. Wow. Dave, thank you so much. I'll tell you what, if we had... Uh, seven more people that gave $500, we would be past our goal. That is that is incredible. So again, our current tally is $1,675, but we're halfway through the month, so we're not even halfway to our goal. We still have a long way to go. If you're planning on giving to our fundraiser, I would really appreciate it if you would give today, especially since later this week and through next week, I'm not going to be around because I'll be on the set of a horror movie filming and I won't be able to give the updates. So any gift that you give is going to mean so much. Every dollar you give is going to help somebody affected by depression. So no gift is too small. I know I made a big deal just now about Dave giving 500, but we've had people give $5 and that still helps us get to our goal. You can help us celebrate Weird Darkness's birthday. You can celebrate the darkness of Halloween, and you can also help people climb out of the darkness that they're trapped in if you just make a donation to our Overcoming the Darkness campaign. To donate, or if you just want to get more information about the campaign, maybe watch a video that I created about it that explains it a bit more, you can go to WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. The fundraiser ends Halloween night at midnight, so please give right now while you're thinking about it. WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming, and thank you in advance for your generosity. I don't think this is exactly scary, per se, but to me it is weird. There have been exactly four times in my life that while sleeping or even just laying still, I have apparently appeared dead to people. I can't exactly explain why. Maybe my breathing is too shallow to where they couldn't even see the rise of my chest, but whatever it was, I definitely appeared to them as if I were dead. The first time this happened, I was 15. I only remember the age because this was the two weeks during the summer my grandmother paid for me to go to a camp, and I only know that I was 15 because that was the last age you could go to the camp before being considered as a possible counselor, ages 16 to 18. It was nighttime and everyone in my cabin decided to go take their showers for the night. I was too tired, so I decided to stay behind and just take my shower in the morning. It must have been at least 20 or 25 minutes before anyone came back. At this point, I was just awake enough to hear them. She looks dead, one of them had said. At the time, I didn't think much of it other than this is the perfect time to pull a prank. So I shot the upper half of my body up out of bed and said, who looks dead? They screamed, I laughed and apologized and then promptly fell asleep. The second time happened a year or so after high school, around 2015 or 2016. It was the summer. Two friends and I decided to take a week-long vacation from our individual jobs to go to a water park. My friend who planned the trip decided to get each of us our own separate rooms, so after a long day, we wouldn't get on each other's nerves. Our rooms were located on a low floor, half-finished due to construction. I don't know if it was because we were two hours from our home and this was the first time being in a hotel room by myself, or that the part of the building we were in was under construction, but I didn't like it. The only nights I actually spent the night in my room were the first and second nights, usually with all the lights on. The rest of the days there I slept with my friend in her room. Even she was creeped out by the hotel. The night I appeared dead to her wasn't anything unusual. We had went to the mall there earlier in the day. I'd gotten a pullover sweatshirt to sleep in. We went to eat and then back to the hotel to sleep. Nothing was unusual when we went to sleep, but later I woke up feeling a pressure on my chest. It was her hand. What are you doing? I asked. It looked like you weren't breathing, and when I tried the finger under your nose thing, I still couldn't tell. Couldn't even see the rise and fall of your chest, so I put my hand there to test if you were breathing, she told me. 
The next thing I noticed was that the pullover sweater I had on when I went to sleep was completely off. I had a tank top on underneath. This wasn't your average large sweatshirt where there was no struggle in getting it on. This was one where the hole was just snug enough you had to force your head through. Did you take off my sweatshirt? I asked her, thinking maybe she did because she couldn't tell if my chest was rising. No, it was already off, she responded. I'm not saying I wasn't the one to pull it off, but I'd never had an article of clothing come completely off when I was asleep. The next morning, she told me what caused her to think I was dead. I had a dream, she said, where I woke up and you were still on the bed. I thought you were asleep. I was getting ready for the day and Jay came in. He sat on the bed next to you and just looked at you. He said, you were dead. I told him that couldn't be, but sure enough, when I checked, you were dead, she concluded. Well, that's when I woke up and I had to check on you to make sure. I was a little freaked out having remembered the summer camp incident, but once again thought nothing of it. The third and fourth times were by my mother. Nothing special really about these times, just she had to come check on me when I was sleeping, just to see how I was doing, and both times I woke up with her hand either on my throat or chest trying to see if there was movement to make sure I was breathing. The same response from her as all the other times, I thought you were dead. I don't really know why to some I appear dead in my sleep. I actually find it quite funny what for the love of the mysterious and paranormal, along with my love of horror movies. Another weird thing I've noticed was that it doesn't matter that I shower every day or even if I'm in a room with five other people, flies will just always come to me, almost as if I were a decaying corpse but still alive. I thought I'd share this story to see if anyone else has ever experienced the same thing that I have, and I recently got really into your podcast, so I thought, why not the guy I spend my work hours listening to? Love the podcast and can't wait to hear more stories in the future. The Final Destination films have exposed audiences to bizarre accidents that could happen to anyone. Although the movie version is over the top, freak accidents are a lot more common than one might think. There are many instances in which people survived tragic experiences, events that most would likely never have walked away from, only to perish in an equally unlikely incident shortly thereafter. The following true stories depict people who have evaded natural disasters – insect attacks, mid-air malfunctioning, mass shooters, car crashes, fires, terrorism and drowning, only to later be felled by unexpected circumstances, and in one instance, an orange peel. In October 2016, Austin McGuff a 21-year-old soldier stationed at Fort Campbell on the Tennessee-Kentucky border was on his way back to base after attending a party. Reportedly, he was disoriented and tried to break into a nursery. While attempting to do so, he struck a wasp's nest. Toxicology reports indicated McGuff was intoxicated. In an attempt to evade the wasps, he inadvertently ran onto Highway 41A, where an oncoming vehicle fatally hit him. In April 2013, an unnamed California driver lost control of his SUV on the windy Malibu Canyon Road. The man crashed onto the mountainside's ledge and was able to jump out of the vehicle onto the road. He barely managed to escape plummeting off a cliff, a fatal fall. Moments after abandoning the car, an oncoming tour bus struck and killed the man. On July 6, 2013, 16-year-old Yi Mang Wan survived the plane crash of Flight Asiana 214 at the San Francisco airport. She laid down 30 feet from the crash site. Injured and waiting for help, Yi Mang remained curled up in a ball. When first responders arrived, a fire truck didn't see the teen and ran her over, killing her instantly. City officials cited the chaos of the wreckage as the main factor 
but Yi Mang's family sued the city for negligence. Jessica Redfield was an up-and-coming sports broadcaster from Denver, Colorado. In 2012, she died at the hands of the Aurora shooter, who entered a midnight screening of the latest Batman film, The Dark Knight Rises, and opened fire on the audience. Before Redfield was a victim of the Aurora Theater shooting, however, she had survived an attack at a mall in Toronto only a month prior. Redfield managed to sneak out of the Eaton Center when the gunman started shooting. 26-year-old Hilda Yolanda Mayol worked in a restaurant on the ground floor of the World Trade Center. She was present during the September 11th attacks in 2001 but miraculously was not injured. Two months later, on a trip to the Dominican Republic, Mayol died on American Airlines Flight 587, which crashed in Queens, New York. At the time, many feared that the crash was a second terrorist attack, but the accident was attributed to the pilot's mishandling of the rudder controls during turbulence. In 1977, the entire University of Evansville men's basketball team, except for one player, died in a crash only 90 seconds after the plane took flight. An ankle injury prevented 18-year-old David Furr from playing with the Purple Aces, so he skipped the flight that would ultimately fell all his teammates. Although the team had previously only ever traveled by bus, the coach requested they fly in style for this one particular away game. Two weeks later, Furr and his 16-year-old brother were involved in a driving accident that resulted in both of their deaths. Jessica DeLima Roll had spent weeks organizing a university party at a local Brazilian club in Santa Maria, Rio Grande do Sul. However, when her boyfriend asked her to stay in and skip the event, Roll agreed at the last minute. This proved to be a life-saving decision. 233 died from a fire that broke out in the nightclub. A week later, 21-year-old Roll and her boyfriend died when their car collided with an oncoming truck. Five-year-old Aiden Evans and his family escaped a massive tornado in Moore, Oklahoma. The May 2013 tornado did enormous damage, and the Evans left their son with family in Jesseville, Arkansas, while they dealt with the aftermath. According to police, the boy threw a tantrum while his parents were out. Reportedly, 50-year-old Lynn Geeling, the neighbor of Aiden's aunt, went to comfort him. But her 150-pound bull mastiff reacted aggressively and attacked the boy. Geeling screamed for help and tried to pry the dog's teeth away, but the boy sustained fatal injuries. The dog was euthanized following the attack. In 2007, Bud Warren and his daughter, Phyllis Ridings, survived a potentially lethal emergency landing after crashing in an open field. The father and daughter were a part of the Experimental Aircraft Association, the incident near Magnolia, Texas did not change their passion for flying. Four years later, the duo's plane again malfunctioned. Warren, 70, and Ridings, 52, were on their way to an air show in Temple when the cockpit began to fill with smoke. Their plane crashed near Montgomery County Airport, killing them both. In June 2007, six-year-old Abigail Taylor from Adena, Minnesota, experienced near-fatal trauma after an accident in a wading pool. Abigail got caught in a pool drain at the Minneapolis Golf Club in St. Louis Park. She had extensive damage to her organs but survived. Nine months later, Abigail died in a special surgery intended to transplant some of the organs that had been damaged in the incident. Her death sparked outrage, and Minnesota state officials instated new laws to make swimming pools safer throughout the county. Bobby Leach was a famed daredevil in the early 1900s. He was a professional stuntman in the Barnum & Bailey Circus, and he performed many of his stunts in front of live audiences. His most notable and illegal achievement is surviving a barrel ride over Niagara Falls in 1911, the second person to ever do so and survive. Leach traveled internationally and he toured to New Zealand in 1926. While there, Leach reportedly slipped on an orange peel and gravely injured his leg. His wound ultimately developed gangrene, leading to doctors' decision to amputate. 
Even still, Leach passed two months later from his injuries at approximately 68 years old. Typically, the obituary comes after the death, but not in this case. Considered a trailblazer for the black nationalist movement, Marcus Garvey was a fierce Jamaican politician who advocated the return of those affected by the African diaspora. It came as no surprise to Garvey that he had many political opponents. However, the politician was shocked after coming across a fake obituary in the Chicago Defender. The obituary, which was reportedly negative and demeaning about Garvey's opinions, enraged the man so much that he suffered two strokes and passed away on June 10, 1940. And I've left this one for last because it's the strangest of all. In 2011, medical professionals had declared a Kazan Russian woman dead at 49 years old. Her family began the grieving process and arranged a funeral. At the memorial, the woman who everyone thought was dead awoke in the casket to the sound of prayers as the family prepared her body for burial. Realizing that she was now attending her own funeral, the woman reportedly bolted upright and screamed for help. At that moment, she suffered a heart attack and subsequent heart failure, which resulted in her death. With stories like these, you have to wonder if perhaps the Grim Reaper isn't in fact a real entity, and once you're on his list, you must be crossed off. When Weird Darkness returns, Army First Lieutenant Paul Byron Whipke was as brave as he was handsome. After telling his fellow troops that he was going out for a drink, he never came back and was never heard from again by anyone. October is not only our favorite month due to Halloween and it also being the anniversary of the podcast, but for me, it's the busiest month. October crept up on me fast this year, and on the last day of September, I was scrambling to get things done late into the night. Because I knew it would be a late night, I grabbed a Magic Mind performance shot in the late afternoon and it gave me the mental clarity, alertness, and motivation I needed to get everything done before October rolled in. I'm relying more and more on Magic Mind than the energy drinks I used to live on. Not only does it work better and last longer without the energy drink crash, but it's also a healthier alternative. Fewer calories, fewer carbs, tons of essential vitamins, and that added benefit of a small dose of caffeine for that kickstart I need when starting my day. I became a subscriber, so I would never accidentally run out of Magic Mind. It's that effective for me. And because you are a Weird Darkness weirdo, you can try Magic Mind and get it at 48% off your subscription. Visit magicmind.com slash weirddarkness and then use the promo code DARKNESS20 to get the deal. If you'd rather just try it without a subscription, this code will also work for a one-time purchase and you'll get 20% off. Make Magic Mind part of your daily routine and you will definitely notice a difference. Again, visit magicmind.com slash weirddarkness and then use the promo code DARKNESS20 to get 48% off your subscription or 20% off a one-time purchase. MagicMind.com slash WeirdDarkness, promo code DARKNESS20. To paraphrase Gilbert and Sullivan, Paul Byron Whipke was the very model of a modern Army first lieutenant. The 26-year-old was smart, brave, serious, and disciplined, described as an all-American young man and a superior officer. He was, in short, one of the last people you could imagine being enveloped by the weird. However, since he is featured in this episode of the podcast, you've probably already guessed that this is exactly what happened. The young aviator and company commander was stationed at Fort Ord, California. On July 10, 1958, 
He told some friends at Fort Ord's bachelor officer's quarters that he was going into town to get a drink. Instead, he drove to Mojave, hundreds of miles away, and checked into a motel. The next day, he bought 14 gallons of gas. After that, the lieutenant was never heard from again. Five weeks after he was last seen, Whipke's car was found in a desolate and forbidding region of Death Valley, about 400 miles from Fort Ord. The car appeared to be in perfect order, containing the missing man's suitcase, dog tags, and other personal belongings. There was nothing indicating what might have happened to the car's owner. Whipke's bank accounts had not been touched immediately before he disappeared, and they had not been used since. The Army listed Whipke as absent without leave, and then as a deserter. His superiors seemed curiously incurious about what had become of this highly promising young man. According to the FBI, the Army made only the most cursory investigation about Whipke's disappearance, assuming that he would eventually return. There, matters rested, until the spring of 1982 when the Army Board for Correction of Military Records held a three-day hearing into Whipke's disappearance. The board concluded that Whipke died the day after he vanished. They added enigmatically that his unauthorized absence is excused as unavoidable, that his death was incurred in the line of duty, not due to his own misconduct. The board theorized that Whipke may have wandered out into the desert and succumbed in the extreme heat and that the shifting sands have made it a near impossibility to find or recover his remains. The Army Adjutant General's office issued a certificate of honorable service, and as far as the Army was concerned, that was that. The military offered no possible explanation for Whipke's unauthorized absence. All this was not nearly enough for Whipke's brother Carl, though. An Army veteran himself, he was convinced from the start that the military knew far more about Paul's disappearance than what they wanted to say. His suspicions were first alerted when, just the day after his brother vanished, he learned that officers were already packing Paul's belongings for shipment home. This odd haste, he commented dryly, left him super hyper, super quick. They must have known he wasn't coming back, Carl argued or they'd have waited before writing him off. Carl also dismissed the Army's contention that Paul had deserted. They said he ran away into Death Valley. Then they hinted that he killed himself. I can't buy that. Nobody would go AWOL in a hellhole like Death Valley. And there are easier ways to kill oneself than dehydration. Carl was of the belief that members of the Army drove Paul's car into the desert sometime after the lieutenant disappeared. The government knows what happened to my brother, Carl said in a 1983 interview. They can't shake me of that. There are so many questions still unanswered. Carl Whipke made it his life's work to find the truth about his brother's end. In June 1977, Carl sought information from the FBI under a Freedom of Information Act request. His petition went unanswered until 1978, when he was informed that the FBI had destroyed all their files on the Whipke case in December 1977. Undaunted, Carl accumulated thousands of government documents, as well as many sympathetic allies in Congress and the military. But all these efforts just left him going down darker and darker rabbit holes. Carl claimed to have discovered that Paul flew in five atomic test explosions in Nevada. His theory was that Paul was exposed to dangerous levels of radiation and may have seen evidence that the Army was conducting classified experiments on human beings. Although the Army confirmed that Lt. Whipke was assigned to temporary duty at Camp Desert Rock, Nevada between July and October 1957, they dismissed Carl's other claims as unsupported by the evidence. However, even the Army report acknowledged that after Paul returned from Nevada, he developed black moles and planter warts on his hands and body. Whipke began to complain of unaccountable feelings of sickness. He lost a large amount of weight, and the normally cool-headed officer became nervous and depressed. Several months before he disappeared, 
the lieutenant had all his teeth removed and was fitted with full dentures. A fellow officer, Charles Lewis, recalled that after Wipke's Nevada flights, Paul was interviewed by Army intelligence agents. It was noted that these interviews left Wipke nervous and uptight. Paul's actions were always ethical on and off base, said Lewis, but Paul became suspiciously silent to others when the agents were mentioned or appeared on the scene at the airfield or the officers' club. Carl Wipke developed even more sinister theories regarding his brother's disappearance. He believed it possible that Paul was a secret agent murdered by his fellow spies, or that he flew covert missions over the Soviet Union only to be shot down, or that he died as a result of army testing of nerve gas or atomic weapons, or that his discovery of the military's use of human guinea pigs led him to be murdered. Just to make things even stranger, Carl also learned that his brother may have used the alias Paul B. Whipper for reasons unknown. I'd be satisfied if the Army would say they can't tell us for security reasons, but until then we can't rule anything out. The truth about Paul Whipke's fate probably cannot be called unsolved. Paul Whipke was very likely correct that someone, somewhere, knew the truth about what had happened to the young lieutenant. However, to date, this information has never been revealed. Until that day comes, Carl Wipke once said there will be no peace in our family. If you follow strange disappearances of military personnel, this story may have sounded somewhat familiar. That's because it does have a resemblance to another bizarre disappearance of another young Cold War era man, West Point cadet Richard Cox. It's a curious fact that many of history's most bizarre mysteries center around people who had appeared to be the most normal or even ideal figures imaginable. An outstanding example is Richard Colvin Cox. The 21-year-old West Point cadet was handsome, highly intelligent, ambitious, well-liked, hardworking, and clean living. After a fine two-year Army career where he was stationed in Germany, he achieved his life's great dream when he secured an appointment in the military academy. He was very much in love with his fiancée, a pretty girl from his hometown of Mansfield, Ohio, and appeared to have a sterling future ahead of him. In short, he seemed to be the last person in the world to have his life engulfed by the weird. But that was exactly what happened. Cox's golden boy existence began to tarnish on January 7, 1950. The cadet, who was in charge of quarters in Cox's company, received a phone call from a man asking if Dick Cox was there. The caller left a message. Just tell him George called. He'll know who I am. We knew each other in Germany. Unfortunately, the cadet who took the call could only be fairly certain the man gave his name as George. When Cox was told of his phone call, he claimed to have no idea who the man could be. However, when George came to see him later that evening, he recognized him at once. The two men seemed happy to see each other, and they left together. It was presumed they were headed for the Hotel Thayer, the one dining establishment open to cadets other than the mess hall. Instead, they sat in George's car, drinking whiskey. When Cox returned to his room an hour and a half later, he was drunk, which was very much out of character for him. He was so inebriated he immediately fell asleep at his desk. When the 10.30 tattoo sounded, his two roommates were startled to see Cox suddenly spring to his feet and run into the hallway, shouting something peculiar. The two roommates thought it sounded like Alice that he was screaming, but it's also been speculated that he was crying, Alice kaput, German for all is ended. We'll never know for sure what Cox was saying or what this unguarded heart cry could have meant. Cox quickly pulled himself together, somewhat. He returned to the room and, ignoring his roommate's questions, fell on his bed and went instantly back to sleep. The next morning, he told his roommates something about his experiences the previous night. He claimed that his visitor, whose name he never mentioned, had been part of his outfit in Germany. Cox described him as a morbid guy who liked to talk about all the killing he had done in the army. Cox added that this guy 
had also impregnated a German girl and then murdered her. Despite his expressed disgust with his acquaintance, he'd had another meeting with the stranger that afternoon. The following week seemed perfectly normal. Cox's grades remained high and his behavior impeccable. Then, on January 14th, despite the fact that he'd expressed hope that he wouldn't have to see that fellow again, Cox was seen talking with George near his barracks. Soon afterwards, he told a friend that he'd be having dinner with his mysterious acquaintance, although he did not appear to relish the idea. His fellow cadet later said that Cox seemed to think of seeing George as an unpleasant duty, but one that, for whatever reason, he could not avoid. A little after 6 p.m., Cox left his room to see George. That was the last indisputable sighting of Richard Colvin Cox. Although he had signed out, no one reported seeing him leave the barracks. There's no record of him dining at the Thayer that night, or anywhere else for that matter. He simply vanished. When Cox failed to return the next morning, the police and CID were called in. The search for the cadet became the biggest manhunt in West Point's history. And it was all in vain. Although the case has spawned much fanciful theorizing, no one has ever determined what became of this young man whose promising life ended so quickly and bizarrely. George has also remained a phantom. Rigorous investigation never found a clue indicating who he was or where he went. Although it is generally assumed that he was behind Cox's disappearance, it is a complete mystery how or why he would spirit off the cadet. As can be imagined, the usual wild theories floated around. Did the cadet flee in fear for his life as a result of his testimony in a court-martial? Was he somehow involved in the murder he claimed George had committed? Was he kidnapped by the Soviets in retaliation for his counter-espionage activities in Germany? Most speculation about Cox's fate focuses on his earlier military career, where he'd been part of an intelligence unit. 1950 was the height of the Cold War, and it's been suggested that Cox was involved in some sort of espionage program that led to him being enlisted as a secret agent by the CIA. While this is probably the most plausible, least implausible theory, no real evidence for it has been found. In their book about the case, Oblivion, Marshall Jacobs and Harry Mailhafer presented a claim from a retired CIA official that Cox was given a new name by the intelligence community and spent the Cold War smuggling scientists connected to Russia's nuclear program across the Iron Curtain. Allegedly, Cox died of cancer sometime in the 1990s, his true identity still a secret. These authors believed that Cox was likely gay, a theory, however, based mainly on thin rumor. They argued that this secret, which would have jeopardized his career, inspired the cadet to stage his own disappearance. For what it's worth, Cox's family rejects this entire scenario, insisting that he would have found a way to contact his mother, to whom he had been very close. Mrs. Cox died in 1986, still tormented by the puzzle of her son's disappearance. It's impossible to say if Jacobs and Mailhafer's source, who offered no proof whatsoever for all of this, was credible. Their theory also fails to satisfactorily explain why it was necessary for Cox to disappear and take on a new persona to his very grave. Jacobs and Mailhaver also mentioned a curious link to the case. They learned of a suspect in a 1985 murder named Robert W. Frisbee. Many years earlier, Frisbee, under the name of Robert Dion, had been stationed at Fort Knox at the same time as Cox. It was probable that the two had known each other. Frisbee, or Dion, who had once been involved in making phony IDs, was said to resemble descriptions of George. This was all intriguing, but as no one was ever able to conclusively tie Frisbee to George and Cox's disappearance, it all proved to be just another brick wall. There are at least two reports of someone allegedly seeing Cox after he disappeared. In 1954, Ernest Shotwell, who had known Cox in the Army, told the FBI that two years earlier he had run into Cox at a bus station in Washington, D.C. 
The two men spoke briefly, with Cox mentioning that he was on his way to Germany. Shotwell said his old friend was clearly displeased to see him. Cox was agitated and curt, and after a few minutes, abruptly broke off the conversation and stalked off. Shotwell said that he had not spoken of this encounter before because he had not known at the time that Cox was a missing person case. Another reported encounter with the vanished cadet supposedly took place in a Florida bar in 1960. An undercover FBI contact made the acquaintance of an R.C. Mansfield, who eventually admitted that his real name was Richard Cox. When this FBI agent later learned of the Cox mystery, he tried to set up another meeting with Mansfield, but he never heard from the man again. While these reports are considered plausible, they still don't answer the question of why Cox vanished. Or to take the simplest theory, did the sinister George, for who knows what personal reasons, murder the young cadet and hide the body somewhere in the woods around West Point or deep in the Hudson? Richard Cox will likely always remain one of America's classic enigmatic disappearing acts. If you made it this far, welcome to the Weirdo Family. If you liked this episode, please share it on your social media or tell a friend or family member about the podcast and maybe they'll become a Weirdo Family member too. Do you have a dark tale to tell of your own? Fact or fiction, click on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com and I might use it in a future episode. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. He Kept Calling His Family After He Was Dead is by Aaron McCann for Ranker. I Am Not Dead is from weirdo family member Krista Arend. The Vanishing Lieutenant and the Disappearing Cadet is from Strange Company. And You Can't Escape the Reaper was written by Ryan Davis. Weird Darkness Theme by Alibi Music. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark, and now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that He may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on Him, because He cares for you. And a final thought. No color, no religion, no nationality should come between us. We are all children of God. Mother Teresa I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.